Hello, welcome in. It's a Sunday edition of Always College Football. It's the roundup. It's the wrap up. We haven't really coined a term just yet, but it's basically the Sunday takeaways. Does that work? Hope everybody's having a great Sunday morning. Here's where we're at right now in college football. All right. There were a lot of very interesting performances. I think the defense is making a comeback. I think that there's a team on the West Coast that not enough people are talking about, and they might be the team I'd least like to play. There are a lot of good stories in college football, a lot of good stories, a lot of good narratives, but seldom are they based on fact. And finally, dynasties aren't always dead. They just might look a little different. That's the immediate 30-second rundown. Shall we dive a little deeper? Let's do it. All right, let's start in the noon slate. Florida State and Clemson uh, on the call for this game. What an incredible game, by the way. I mean, Florida State didn't have the lead until overtime. Now, one moment of regulation do they have the lead, and yet they find themselves walking away with a win on the road at their bitter, bitter, hostile rival in the ACC. Teams that had combined to win 11 of the last 12 championships in the conference. Let's just for a moment think about what went down in this game. Florida State has been a really good second half football team. Look at LSU. I know last week, Boston College, maybe not a great example, but remember they did climb out to a 21 point lead against Boston College before they kind of exhaled. Then Boston College just kind of chipped away, chipped away, and got back in the game. Florida State's been a pretty good second half football team. And everyone seems to think that Clemson's dynasty is done. I don't align with that. I think Clemson might not be as deep as they once were. Maybe the margins between them and everybody else aren't what they once were. That's a good football team. And they're really good on defense in particular. I mean, really good on defense. So for Florida State to somehow find a way into victory in this game was pretty dang remarkable. And to think about the timely pressure that was brought up. It was a bust by Phil Moffa. I'm watching it. I'm looking at it. I'm like, I swear he busted that. Because you look at the quarterback's mannerisms. You can always tell when a quarterback thinks he's protected because this was like a max protection for the most part. Phil Moffa busts the protection. Kate Klubnick doesn't see him at all. He shouldn't. He's expected to be protected. So next thing you know, boom, balls out to the house. And then, of course, the White's kick there from 29 yards to potentially win the game by that 90 seconds left or so. It's a little bit wide left. And then Keon Coleman, big jump ball catch. And then everyone's going to talk about the third and one decision. Uh, everyone's killing Garrett Riley, understandably so. Uh, here's why it wasn't Garrett Riley's fault. Third and one, you just rip off a nine yard run by Will Shipley. You have an inside run called again. But built into this inside run is an RPO. And to the left-hand side, if the quarterback likes the look, there's freedom for the quarterback if he likes the look to throw the now route to the left-hand side. Well, Will Shipley was probably going to hit his head on the goalpost if he handed it off, but Cade Klubnick liked the pre-snap look. This is part of Cade Klubnick's development. Now, Garrett Riley, should he have tagged the RPO? Probably not. Take it out of the quarterback's hands. Take away that freedom. But at the same time, Cade Klubnick has to understand down and distance. It's third and one. Hand it once, twice on fourth and one. Who cares? You got to have it. You can't take a lost yardage play. And you can't really take an unnecessary risk by flipping it out to the boundary. It was a really bad decision. But it's part of the quarterback decision. It's not Garrett Riley's fault. Quarterback has to understand that down and distance overrules the rule that you would have in normal circumstances when that play is called. Difficult circumstances feel terrible for the kid, but it's all part of his maturation. It's all part of his development. Let's keep it going here. All right. Some of the most impressive performances of the weekend. Oregon, how can you not be impressed with what they did against Colorado? Colorado is not good, y'all. I mean, I, I hate I hate to kind of rain on the parade, and I know it's been a really fun story, and I know that I know that it's, you know, Dion's going to capture the nation's attention. I think it's really important to acknowledge that while they have talent, they're just not that good yet. And it's not there. It's not that they don't have good players. It's that the offensive line, if you are going to be a high quality outfit in college football, in the NFL, in high school, I don't care. If you're going to be a high level out outfit, you have to be good up front. You just have to be. And, and 
it, to a certain extent, I, maybe we've adjusted in college football to the point where you don't have to be really, really good up front, but you can't have an offensive line that's a liability. You just can't. Okay, and and their offensive line, I, I don't even know if liability is fair. I think it's that big of an issue. I mean, liability is almost a, a compliment for that group. And Oregon just took it to him. And while I think what Dion's done, he has already overachieved and will continue to because I think they're bound for at least a bowl game. What he's done is remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. But when we talk about and we're putting them in the top 20, we're putting them in the you know cultural playoff conversation, they're not even close to that. They're not even close to that. And they found out the hard way last uh, yesterday against Oregon. Oregon's a really good football team. Really, really good football team. And I think... Oregon is going to be a huge problem for everyone on the West Coast. Uh, but I continue to be remarkably impressed with what I've seen from the Pac-12 top to bottom. I'm telling you guys right now, and I watched them last night. I made a point to stay up and watch them because I felt like it was important to not just only not just this show, but for me to kind of just get a feel for the game. Washington might be the best team in the country. I'm not being a like hot take artist. You guys know me by this point. Like you know me, I do not do hot takes. I'm just not. It's not my game. It's, it's not. But of all the teams that I would not like to play, Washington might be at the top of the list. I'm just telling you. Michael Penix took the field yesterday, up fourteen nothing. Never took a snap. They get a pick six, pick six, and they have a defensive touchdown or whatnot. And or a return touchdown, whatever it was. I don't recall. But he did not take the field until they were up like 13, 14, nothing. And Michael Penix, right now, if I had to submit a Heisman ballot, would be my Heisman Trophy winner. This guy's making throws that are just, it's just ridiculous. And the receiver core, we always talk and we say, oh, you know, Ohio State's the best receiver core. Okay, I, I'm not going to like push back on that. I'm not. I think Ohio State has phenomenal wide receivers. Proved it again last night. I'm telling you, Washington's receiver core does not take a backseat to anybody. Anybody. Now, if you want, if you prefer Ohio State, fine. I'm telling you, Washington's right there. And I, it, it's starting to get like a little bit infuriating because you think like, well, you know, it's brand bias, right? Like, I'm telling you, Washington might not be a blue blood. They are legit. And their wide receivers are legit. And... I think they're as difficult a matchup as there is in college football right now. I had them in my poll top two last week. I'm telling you, I'm flirting with putting them at one. And you're going to say, well, look at the defense last night. Defense gave up a lot of points. Okay, they also created their own points on a couple different occasions too. And how many inter how many balls did they pick off from Ryan, from Ben Finley? I mean, it was... That team's complete, man. They're really good. Uh, teams that are not complete, that have some serious issues, but I still think there are things to potentially work out. I think LSU has a lot to clean up. Last week to this week, this is a team that's like, man, they are up and down. I mean, it's like one week, it's like, goodness gracious, no one's beaten that team. And the next week, it's like, what was that? They're getting pushed around by Arkansas? I mean, it's like LSU, since Brian Kelly took over, has had... Big, big, big moments, big highs and real lows. I mean, it's like every week is just a roller coaster. And I'm not saying they're not really good. They obviously got the win last night. You win in the conference, you win in the league. That's, hey, take it and run. But Arkansas had not really been a physically imposing bunch up to this point. And then all of a sudden, LSU's getting pushed around. It was just odd. So I think there's a lot to clean up there for Arkansas. Alabama. Kind of talked about this last week, and I am convinced that by the end of the season, this defense, top to bottom, is going to be among the nation's elite. I, I just see it trending that direction. And yesterday was another great example of that. Now, I, I think Ole Miss maybe a little overvalued at 15, maybe not an elite group offensively or defensively, but. They have some weapons. Like they were healthier yesterday taking the field than they'd been in a while and thought that maybe they might pose some issues for Alabama. Well, they just couldn't really get anything going offensively outside of the opening drive or the first couple drives. I mean, they couldn't really get much going at all. 
And Alabama, while I still think they have a lot of issues at quarterback, I thought Jalen Milrow in the second half, if you can get that version of Jalen Milrow, they're going to continue to be a real handful. And I've said it on this program before, people that are writing the dynasty off, all this other stuff, that's fine. You can do that. And I think Alabama fans at this point are a little uncomfortable with the notion of winning by 14 and going back to 2008 or 2009 where you're winning games, you know, uh, you know, 21, 10, 24, 10, 17, 7, uh, 17, 3, like last week. I know that's not a sexy score, but that's kind of the recipe. I think for Alabama to win big this year. And, it's you're not going to get a lot of style points. It's not going to be pretty, but it's going to be kind of a grinded out type of group. And that's okay. That's okay because the end result is all that matters. And I've been pretty impressed with how they played yesterday. Looking back at the tape, I thought the defensive plan was excellent. Now that they did a really good job in the back end, they've cleaned up a lot in the secondary. So I'm cautiously optimistic that this is a repeatable performance. And I think that this team is going to continue to be an excellent group. As far as defensive performances are concerned, how many turnovers is Penn State going to force this year? Because if it's in the triple digits, I'm not sure I would push back on that. I mean, one week removed from having five turnovers against Illinois, they forced four against Iowa. They still have yet to turn the ball over themselves. They got to be plus 100 in the turnover margin, it feels like. I mean, this team is, and we've kind of talked about it. How about holding Iowa to a cool 76 yards? You feel good about that? Because (laughs) that's about as big of a beat down as I've seen in a minute. Four first downs, one for nine on third down, 76 total yards, 56 passing yards, 20 rushing yards, 1.2 per carry. and. 14 minutes of time of possession. I'd say that's a pretty good performance defensively. Manny Diaz had him flying around, man. This group is a handful. Big fan. Big fan of how they're playing on the defensive side. I still am trying to kind of figure out what they are offensively. but And I think they're really good, by the way. I, but I do think that this group on the defensive side probably won't get the attention it deserves nationally because they don't have a G on their helmet. But... This group is legit. I'm telling you, this group is legit. And against Michigan, against Ohio State, against all the teams that they're going to face throughout the schedule, I don't want to play against that group on defense. And I know Iowa's egregiously bad on that side of the ball. I understand that. You're going to say, good too. I get it. I get it. <laughs> but I would also say to hold a team in check to that level was unlike anything I've seen all season on that side of the ball. Uh, The big game of the night, Notre Dame, Ohio State. And you know I took the Irish in this game, thought it was going to be a war. Did not think it was going to be as low scoring as it was. But all things considered, this kind of played out in a way that I thought it might. In a sense that it was going to be a line of scrimmage game. It's going to be about the defensive line of Ohio State, the defensive line of Notre Dame against the offensive line of Ohio State and the offensive line of Notre Dame. And that's really, I I thought that that's what it really came down to. Because if you really think about it, and you think about just the moments, all right, there was really only one big play in the game. I mean, there there weren't a lot of significant plays, if you think about it, all right? So you had the the Travion Henderson run around the left-hand side, 61 yards, right? The the longest run for Audrick Estime was 22 the longest play from scrimmage for Notre Dame was Jaden Greathouse's catch that went for 28. So there, there weren't a lot of big plays in the game. I mean, it felt like a big, big moment, a big game. So here's my takeaways in the game. One, Ohio State, and I saw Ryan Day's clip where he was saying that Lou Holtz questioned our toughness. I, I don't really understand why, why anyone would question Ohio State's toughness, man. I, I do think that they just because you have great wide receivers doesn't mean you're soft. Okay. That's not, that's not the case. It's not the case at all. I mean, Ohio state also has pretty good defensive linemen and pretty good offensive linemen. 
So just because the receivers are the stars doesn't mean you're soft. I think that's absurd. But what I would say is that for all intents and purposes, Ohio State proved to the world last night that if you want to make it a knockdown, drag out dogfight, we can play that game too. And I, I wasn't sure they could do that. I think Ohio State's extremely comfortable playing in space. I think Ohio State's extremely comfortable being able to put drives together. Last night was a ball control, field possession, defensive, grinded out type of game. And they found a way. And I thought it was a great performance. It was a resilient performance and an absolute gut-wrenching loss for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Sam Hartman, I thought, did a lot of really nice things, especially early in the game. I thought their plan was excellent. Hey, let's just slow it down. Let's have long, methodical drives. Let's huddle up and take our time. Let's make sure that we get the tight ends involved. Mitchell Evans, I thought, had a terrific day. The running game got going there in the second half. It really wasn't a huge factor early on. But ultimately, the defense, you could just kind of tell as things were going on. They had the fourth down conversion on the final drive, the third and long conversion. I'm not sure what they were doing on the third and long conversion, by the way. Like it was a great throw. It was a really, really, really nice throw. It was a great catch. But I don't know why they're playing. Why are you dropping into the end zone? Like, I don't, I mean, what are we doing? Understand how far Ohio State has to go. Like, understand here. I know that, hey, the yellow line on television is not on, it's not on the field. I, I understand that. Like, that's, that's imaginary. That's for us at home. Why are you dropping into the end zone? I, I just will never understand that. Like, understand the down and distance. Understand where they have to get. If your deepest defender is deeper than that line to gain, I think you have butchered it in the secondary. Just a thought. Moving forward, though, to the final couple plays, I could have called it from a mile away. It was going to be sprint right lock on the first play. <laughs> they covered it well. It was a nice design. And then you have, hey, let's roll the dice. You got one yard to go. They handed it off. It was a great run by Trainum. Great job staying upright, crossing the line to gain. Touchdown for the Buckeyes game set match. How the heck on planet Earth do you have 10 guys on the field defensively? Like that cannot happen. Can't. I'm sorry. Like, and I know you're out of timeouts. I like I know that there are I, I've heard all the circumstances of this and that. And well, you know, we didn't want to give them another chance to kind of regroup. What? Like jump into the neutral zone and tackle the guard and give them this much closer on the line to gain just so you can get 11 guys on the field. Like, I don't I don't take a penalty. I don't care what you have to do. Like you cannot play the two most important snaps of the game undermanned. Just can't. Can't happen whatsoever. So, a lot to clean up. Clearly proves that Notre Dame, while they played a beautiful game in a lot of ways, the self-inflicted mistakes in the biggest moments will be what I remember from that matchup and that performance. Either way, I actually think the nation gained respect for the Irish last night. Not sure they needed a lot of people to kind of convince them that they were tough enough, that they were physical enough. But that was one of those games where I came out of the game thinking, I really like both teams. Like, that was an old school throwdown. And I came away really respecting what I saw. That'll do it for us here with our Sunday wrap up, by the way. A, a lot of really important performances that we did not get to. SC, Georgia. Georgia defense, by the way, looking a little bit human against the UAB Blazers. Uh, a handful of others that, that I'd like to break down at some point here in the next couple of days. Did not get to Oregon State, Washington. Uh, did not get to North Carolina's dismantling of Pitt. Did not get to Duke, who crushed UConn. Probably not going to talk about that one on Monday, just going to be honest. But the rest of them, we will hit. Monday edition of Always College Football. You can check it out on the ESPN YouTube page, or you can always download the podcast. Please like, you can rate, and you can subscribe. It will really help us out, and we really look forward to coming and providing you with an awesome show here one day from now. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, and Cohen, who's our special guest today, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's always college football.